Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, Mr. Real. How are you doing? Uh, wait a few moments. I am having a great day. How's your day going? Well, fine, since you made it to the podcast. I think it was yeah. less than a minute before go time when you took your seat. Three minutes. but Three yes. minutes. It just yeah, seemed yeah. like a minute to me. It, it was close. It was right yes. down to the deadline. Yes. Well, I'm glad that you're here. Now, we've got a really important show tonight, and I dressed up for the occasion. And I see you did too, so that's a good thing. Did you have any announcements that you wanted to make? Uh, only that Maven is going to put into the live chat, which is on that side over there. And uh, also down below, uh, I will put it in the comments here shortly. We would really appreciate it, folks, if everyone who is participating and is interested in our show, if you'll sign up for our bi-monthly newsletter, uh, we'd very much appreciate that. This is Mormonism Live. Our website is mormonismlive.org. And we're part of the Mormon Discussion umbrella, which is uh, the same name for the YouTube cha uh, channel, Mormon Discussion uh, Inc. And that's all I've got, my friend. Well, thank you very much. We've got a wonderful show tonight. And by wonderful, I mean very important. And really, it is worth dressing up for. It's a serious subject. I'll be uncharacteristically serious, I think, this evening. I think everybody who's been following Mormonism Live knows that there's a case that's going on out in Pennsylvania involving the LDS Church. And the two main things that happened are in 2022, former Bishop Sean Gooden in Pennsylvania was arrested and charged with child sex abuse from about 20 years earlier, from 1997 to the year 2000, basically that three year period. That was in 2022, over 20 years later that he was arrested on that charge. And that has been proceeding through the system. He's already pleaded guilty to one set of counts, and I think he may have to the second set. There are two victims involved, uh, young boys at the time. And then in January of this year, 2024, by the way, today's date, for those of you watching in the future, today is February 21st, 2024. So this is still recent. I think it was January 31st of 2024, the state president in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania state, whose name is Rhett Hensey, he was arrested and charged with failing to report this incident. The allegation being that one of the victims and Bishop, well, Sean Gooden, he's not a bishop anymore, but I think he was at the time that he confessed it or told the state president about it, so the state president heard from the victim, he heard about it from the perpetrator, Sean Gooden, and then he did not report it as required under the law to the government and to law enforcement. So he has been charged with that. The church has made it really clear that they're going to back him and that they're going to fund his representation. And what's happened tonight is that we are, we're lucky enough to have on the show two members of Sean Gooden's family. And by that, I mean his former wife, now his ex-wife, Rebecca Gooden, is joining us to tell us what happened in her life while all this was going on. So we get a behind the headlines look at what was happening on the ground in Pennsylvania during these years. And Rebecca will join us. And also her son, Matthew Gooden, is going to join us. So if we can bring them into the studio, Mr. Real. There's Matthew on the right. And there's Rebecca on the left. Good evening. How are you? Good. Good. How are you? Thanks for having us. Well, you're very, very welcome. I do understand that you are uh, Sean Gooden's ex-wife now. Yes. Okay. So what we want to do is I want to give a chance for Rebecca to tell her story about what happened, everything that she thinks is important. And I'm going to try and be minimally intrusive, maybe just uh, discussing things with you, maybe uh, helping you along the way. I know it's your story and you lived it, but we've talked quite a bit and I've made a lot of notes. So, and Matthew's going to be here to add his two cents whenever he thinks that's important. Okay. So Rebecca, let me talk, start off by saying, when was it that you and Sean Gooden got married? Uh, we married, got married in August of 1996. Okay. And we all know that the period of the allegation of the child sex abuse is the three years from 1997 to the year 2000. So that's starting right after you got married. Is that correct? Yeah. From my understanding, it was to the year 2000. Okay. What do you say? 
There's going to be uh, a couple, at least, of uh, bombshells dropped tonight. And one of them I think we should probably drop at the beginning. And I'll let you do this, Rebecca. We're not going to mention any names of any of the victims. But their relationship is going to be important for you to tell the tale and the story as it happens. Do you want to go ahead and say that now? Yeah, the victims were my two brother, two of my brothers. I have three brothers and the two youngest. Are the the two youngest. So back in around 2000, um, you're probably around 20, you're in your early 20s. Mm -hmm. 25. Okay. All right. And the same for Sean Gooden? Yeah, he's almost a year older than me. So yeah, about the same. Yeah, and your little brothers would have been around 11 10, and 13 years younger 11 and 13 than me. 13 years old at the time. Okay. Yeah, well, younger than me. So if I was 25, 12, and I don't know, whatever the math is. Yeah. Nine and 12, maybe, or I don't know, younger. That's that's fine. I just want to get that out of the way so that everybody understands because I was I was shocked when you told me that all of a sudden mm -hmm. the reports that are coming out in the news started making more sense as you told your story to me. So as I understand it, everything was uh, pretty much apparently idyllic in your marriage and your family. Um, there was no indication that anything bad had been done by Sean Gooden mm -hmm. to your brothers and everybody just proceeds as if everything's good and sean gooden uh mm -hmm. is active in the church i know you're active in the church he proceeds to mm -hmm. be called into leadership roles including into the state presidency as a counselor yeah. i believe and then in 2016 i think it was that sean gooden your ex-husband was called as a bishop is that correct i whatever the dates i told you i don't remember um yeah. But yeah, you were talking about my family. We would get together for holidays. Um, we'd go on vacations together and nobody ever said anything to me. I had no, no idea. Um, you know, my brothers would hang out with Sean and yeah, no idea. Um, and he had several church callings. He was called into the bishopric um, like 18 years ago, 2005, he was in the bishopric. He was been young men's president most of the time we were married. Um, he was, when we were moved to this area, he was young men's president and then he was on the high council and then he was called into the state presidency. And I was he also involved, with, in, I'm sorry, was he also involved in the Boy Scouts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, his as part of his role in the state presidency, he was on some committee. I don't know what, what it was called, but yeah, he worked closely with the Boy Scouts. Okay. So leadership roles, also young men's president, also working with the mm -hmm. Boy Scouts. Matthew, let me rope you in here for a second and ask you, did you ever see anything unusual in retrospect? No. I was completely blindsided when I first heard about the accusations. Um yeah, I just couldn't in a million years have pictured that my dad was capable of anything related to those types of charges. It just seemed completely out of character to him and completely out of character to the person that I had grown up uh, knowing to be my father. I will tell you, it's a bit interesting to me only because I'm 34 years in a career as a criminal attorney, first as a prosecutor, then as a defense attorney. And I know that frequently when these types of things happen, the family goes along and uh, until somebody discloses, right? But once they disclose, a lot of times they will look back on what happened and then they'll start to see things that maybe didn't line up in retrospect that they didn't see as they were living it. But nothing like that for either of you, apparently. The only thing that was a little bit odd was my youngest brother, He had when he had children, he wouldn't let him come over to the house sometimes. And I would just say, you know, why, why can't they come over? And he would make an excuse or, um, but that's the only thing that I can think of, you know? And I asked him, I said, what, why won't you let the kids come over? And he just, it, sometimes he'd say, cause he um, is not an active member of the church. You know, he'd say, oh, I don't want them around mom and stuff or. Mm, okay. Whatever. So maybe there was something never, a bit odd that does make more sense now that you know more. All well, right. yeah, now that I look back, I'm sure that's why it was. But Rebecca, can I ask you, go ahead and tell us your story. And I know we have to fast forward. I mean, from when you're married in 1996 until things start 
happening, that's a long period of time. So just mm -hmm. take us up to the point where you feel comfortable telling us about when things started to change. Um, so do you want to know when people started finding out then or when I found out? Yes. Uh, take us through when people started finding out. Um, so my we were together. The family was together for Thanksgiving. Um, the one one brother was living here. The other brother came from out of town. And he was up late one night, I think, talking to my mom. Uh, Rebecca, and, I apologize. That was Thanksgiving. That was 2019, correct? Yes. Okay, Thanksgiving of 2019. Please proceed. Um, they were talking and up late one night and it came out that that um, he had been abused by Sean. Um, so your younger and, brother, who's now mm -hmm. an adult in his probably mm -hmm. early 30s or so, mm -hmm. told your mother and his mother. Mom. Yeah, our mom. Okay. That he had been abused. Um, and at so this she, point, you're still married to Sean and he's a bishop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, he's the bishop. Um, and so she knows this information, but doesn't tell anybody. Nobody, they, nobody talks about it. My brother goes home from um, the area back to his house. Um, and I don't think anyone talks about it again until my mom confronts Sean. And I think that was May or June. So it was several months. Yeah. Okay. She confronts Sean and says, you know, did you do this? And he said, I, I, again, I'm not part of these conversations. So this is just what the story I heard. Um, and I, he, yes. And they talk about it and they decide to not tell me. You know, Sean says, please don't tell Rebecca. It, you know, it would be too hard or I don't know. And at that point, my brothers didn't want me to know that they had kept the secret for so long. They, they were happy keeping it a secret, I guess, or thought they were. I don't know. Anyway, um, so they knew then, and I didn't find out until like August. Okay, so May or so of 2020, your mother finally confronts Sean privately with this, mm -hmm. the allegation made mm -hmm. by your younger brother that he had told her th mm -hmm. the previous Thanksgiving. And he admits it. Yes. Correct. But he yes. convinces your mom not to tell you because of whatever reason. Yeah. I mean, this, you know, it's been, it was 20 years ago. It's over. I'm sorry. You know, whatever. I don't know what they talked about, but. Um, and you said but you didn't find out till around August? Mm -hmm. Did anything happen between May and August when you found out? No. Okay. Mm -mm. Well, then go ahead and um, tell us about August of 2020, please. So he, I guess at that point, uh, my mom decides that I have to know. And so she says, if you don't tell her, then I will. And so Sean told me, he said that there was um, abuse, but he, he didn't tell me, I, I didn't know any of the details. Um, it just really downplayed it. He had been abused as a child and said, you know, he was just kind of acting out the games that were played when he was younger. I don't know. He, he really played down what he told me. Um, and I talked to my one brother that was here and I said, what, what do you, what do I need to do? What do you want me to do? Um, and he, he said nothing. I, I didn't, I didn't want it to come out. I wanted it to be a secret. Um, and so I, in my mind, you know, everybody was, had moved on that, it, you know, it was a bad thing, but it wasn't nothing like what was reported, what that he pled, pled guilty to. And I, you know, I didn't know anything even close to that. So if I'm understanding it, your mother basically forces Sean to tell you, but she's not around when he does tell you. So he tells you kind of a whitewashed version of what really happened. Yeah. And I don't know that if... I mean, I don't know when all of the details and everything came out to them. I'm not sure. But I know, but what Sean told me was a very watered down version. And I asked him a couple specific questions that he denied that later I found out were not true. So. Oh, you asked specific questions that he denied and he lied when he was denying it. Yeah. Okay. About the extent of the abuse, I expect. Yes. Okay. So that's August. What happens next? Um, so uh, 
I mean, I, we talk, I talk to my family a little bit I, and everyone is just kind of like, we're, we don't want to go to the police. We don't want to, we just want to move on. You know, Sean says he's sorry to everybody. And I, you know, it, I'm really stressed and anxious. I don't know what to do. There's, you know, ten, there's a lot of tension in the family, but uh, you know, we just kind of go on. At one point my dad says, you know, we should forgive, you know, so is your father active in the, he's active in the church yeah. yeah yeah um and so we just go on and then um my mom decides she needs to stay pregnant do you know why she decided to do that um no okay but she decided i'm going to tell the state she, she probably just felt like someone needed to know he, i mean he was still serving as the bishop your husband so that's she, right Okay, yeah. so she tells the state president, is that in October of 2020? Um, she probably talked to him in September. I'm not sure exactly when they talked. Do you know what she told him? And by the way, this is state president, Red Hensey, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so your mom she goes and told talks to him. him. She told him the story that she had found out that Sean had abused my brothers. And what did President Hensey do? Um. Well, I don't know exactly. I know at some point he reached out to my brothers and got a statement from one of them um, so that he knew what had happened. And, and then his statement, uh, you mean he invited him to come to the office to hear it from himself? No, because he was out of town. He is not local to the area. Um, and so he, I don't know if he I maybe talked on the phone. I think there was a written statement, I, but I'm not sure. Okay. But I, but somehow he contacted my brother and talked to him. Um, and then beginning of October, um, President Hensey called Sean in, in, up to his office and I went with him. Tell us about that. Um, so we were at the stake center and Sean went in to talk to the stake president uh, while I waited outside um, and they talked for a while. And then I came in and he said, you know, this is about the abuse. And I said, I figured. And I said, did what Sean tell you uh, agree with what my brothers told you? And he said, yes. And so in my mind, it was the watered down version, you know? Yeah. And I, I want you to focus on this because this is a critical period for you where mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're trying to find out what really happened because of course you want to know you've asked some specific questions of your husband which he's denied which later turned out to be mm -hmm. true anyway and now he's got to go in and talk to the state president he admits it to the state mm -hmm. president when you're not in the room mm -hmm. you've only heard the watered down version from your husband outside of the room prior to yeah. this right yeah. in august and so now you go in the room and everybody's trying not to talk about the details but you still want to know so you ask the state president did what? So yeah, I said. Go ahead. I said, did Sean's version of the events match my brother's version of the events? And he said, yes. And I said, okay. And so the stake president said, you um, are released as a bishop immediately. Um, you And it was during COVID, so we weren't really meeting anyway. Um, mm -hmm. But he says, you can't preside over any meetings. You can't have more counsel. You can't. You can't act like a bishop. You're, you're released as of right now. Um, and we are in the process of calling another bishop. Um, and we will have your court after you, after any bishop is called. All right. It, was it because of that, that strange uh, situation where you get a confirmation of a story that you think is a watered down version, but the state president knows is not a watered down version. And you're actually talking apples and oranges and he mm -hmm. confirms it, which makes you think the watered down version is true, correct? Yeah. Okay. So what happens from there? Um, so a new bishop is called um, and he had been serving for over four years. So I you know, I think a lot of people probably thought maybe it was just time, you know, they didn't, nobody said anything to me. I mean, I don't, I'm sure lots of people have said lots of things behind my back, but not to me <laughs> so um he was released and um a couple weeks later there was a court and he was excommunicated i've got to ask you this question if you recall mm -hmm. do you yeah. remember if a vote of thanks was asked for 
by the congregation as typically is done when someone's released from their calling? I don't remember. I remember he, they didn't have him sitting on the stand. You know, normally, you know, they're up on the stand and then they get down and the new mm -hmm. ones come up. Um, they just had the whole pre uh, bishopric just sitting in the congregation and they just said, we're calling a new bishop today. Um, and, you know, normally they would have the old bishop bear his testimony. They didn't do that. They just, you know, invited the new bishop to come up and, and talk. Okay. So it was different than what you would normally expect, but I guess probably nobody really saw it as a big deal at the time. Yeah, it wasn't obvious. Mm -mm. Were you present at the ex at the disciplinary council? Uh, no, I didn't go in. What happened there from your perspective? Other than he was excommunicated, but I understand there was there were steps taken to keep that knowledge on the down low. Um, yeah, so they, you know, I thought when you were excommunicated, the whole uh, high council is in there, but that's been changed. It's just the um, stake presidency. Um, and I, when I know that one of the members of the stake presidency wasn't there. There was uh, the stake president and one of the counselors and then somebody else. Um, and the whatever clerks are there, um, and they, you know, went through everything. And I think it, neither of my brothers were there, but I think there was like a written statement, um, from one of them, um, detailing things, I guess. And then, um, I went up to the church, but I didn't go into the, into the room. So then he came out, um, and they deliberated for a while and then he went back in and, said that he was excommunicated um and then i know that he asked for a or he asked or presidency offered to give him a blessing and they gave him a blessing um and then they weren't going to say anything at all to me and then i guess sean had a question and so sean and i went back into the room and talked to presidency for a minute and i was i was an emotional wreck so i just cried and um but, you know, one thing I wanted to point out is President Hensey never spoke to me individually. Um, he's the only one that knew the whole story from the beginning. From the beginning, he's the only one who knew of the, exactly what happened and had talked to everybody. And he saw me in his, that room sobbing um, when Sean was excommunicated and never, never once reached out to me. He never, you know, talked to me um, specifically um, and said, I, you know, do you, are you aware of what has happened? Do you know what, what he's done? Um, my youngest was 16, so he was a minor. He never talked to any of my children and said, did this ever happen to you? Have you ever been hurt or afraid? Nothing. How did that make you feel? very alone because there was I, no one that i could talk to about it yeah i understand that you and uh the hinsies uh did a lot of things together uh, church related i mean your husband was a bishop under the stake president but they had a friendship that was close is that yeah, right they were, they were friends uh -huh. yeah and you and the uh the hinsey wife mrs hinsey yeah or miss hinsey mm -hmm. would you'd plan like uh, girls camp during the summer right yeah, we went to girls camp together. We were, yeah. Yeah, I got a feeling you get yeah. to know somebody pretty good when you're at girls camp together. Yeah. <laughs> and we served. Um, when Sean was in the state presidency, Brett was the uh, executive uh, secretary. So we would we got together a lot, you know, for state presidency stuff too. So, yeah, I love Misty. She's She's great. All right. Well, let me ask you this. Were any steps taken by the stake president who now knows the whole story in all the detail that you don't know, were any steps taken to um, supervise your husband or make sure that he was not, uh, didn't have access to vulnerable people in the ward like children? Now, from my understanding, when the new bishop was called, he was told that Sean had you know was in trouble there was going to be a disciplinary council um and that he wanted to minimize the talk and the you know people were going to say and so the phrase that i heard was oh, just put a blanket on it 
if someone asks, just put a blanket over it. We don't, we don't want to, we don't want to talk about it. And he told, from my understanding, he told the bishop that the reason that he was being excommunicated was over something that happened many, many years ago and had nothing to do with now. Okay. And Did so your husband, he, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, so he, um, he was released and so like he plays the piano. And so even members of the bishopric who would, would call him and say, do you mind filling in and playing the piano? And he, he wasn't allowed because he was excommunicated. But even the members of the bishopric didn't know, at least not in the beginning, because they would ask him to do things. Mm. Um, the husband of the primary president one week asked him to fill in for primary as a substitute teacher because nobody knew. Mm -hmm. no, nobody knew. My eyebrows are doing that because... He didn't do that. He didn't substitute, did he? No, no. Okay, but nobody knew. But your husband. But he could have. But he could have. I mean, he could have. Mm -hmm. And you're going to church every week, and he's going to church every week. I don't know if we were going every week, but we were going. Yeah. You'd be considered. And it was that. important. It was important to Sean because he wanted to. In his mind, he was trying to do what he could so he could get rebaptized. He wanted to get rebaptized. Right. So now we bring it around to the beginning of 2021. Okay. And I know that Matthew had talked to me about something that happened at the beginning of that year. I think it was when you were back from school and you had a discussion with your dad. Is that right? Yeah. So I remember, let's see, I had just come back from school. It was still pandemic. And so for that semester, I just decided I was going to do remote schooling and basically live at home, save money on rent. And uh, at that point in time, me and my three younger siblings were all there at the house. And my dad calls us into his room. Uh, my mom's there and he just says, I just want to let you guys know I have been excommunicated. He doesn't go into the details then. He just says that it was something that had happened a very long time ago that he had felt that he hadn't sufficiently repented of. And that was all that we heard. There wasn't really any pressure from any of us to sort of ask or prod into it. The big thing was that, again, it was still the pandemic. So while I was there, Jacob, uh, my younger brother and I, we were responsible for the sacrament. And we had to know to not invite my dad to get involved with that or try to pass it to him while we were having this stay at home church. Right. And obviously he couldn't bless the sacrament either. Right. He couldn't participate in any way. And this is so, his way of letting you know, because now you're going to find out you're having sacrament at home and it's going to be pretty obvious. Exactly. And yeah. so he just sort of nips that in the bud and mm -hmm. he's just like, I just want you guys to know I've been excommunicated and that's all there is to it. We think it happened a long time ago. Mm -hmm. My thoughts are, well, it couldn't have been that bad is what I remember thinking, because again, he'd been a bishop. He'd been in the state presidency. He'd been on the high council. He'd had all of these leadership responsibilities. He would have had to have passed all of these leadership uh, interviews of worthiness to make sure that he could actually fulfill those responsibilities. And so my thought was, surely if it's anything, it had to have been something slight that he just forgot about and suddenly remembered. And it's just a formality, right? They excommunicated him. And a year or two, we're going to see get re he gets rebaptized and it's just going to be water under the bridge. Right. That's what I remember thinking when I first heard about it. Okay. So that's early 2021. Now, the year of 2021 goes by. You may not be hitting every Sunday, but you're hitting most Sundays. You'd be defined as act active, I think, in the LDS church, uh, Rebecca and uh, Sean, probably Matthew too, at least once you could go back to church. So nothing else happens in 2021 except continuing to go to church, correct? Mm-hmm. All right, yeah. now we roll over into 2022. By the way, I know that Maven's in the background there, at least I think she is. Uh, she had done a timeline and a few uh, great graphics. I don't know if she was wanting to use those yet. So this was just, I didn't know I had, had messaged if we had wanted to put them up, but these were some um, Facebook posts that were provided to us um, just showing his callings, um, you know, and when, when he was switched from um, second counselor to first counselor in the state presidency, that was in 2014. Um, and then um, when he became a bishop. So I think that's all that we've kind of passed 
Um, but yeah, I can take this hey, down. And, and, Bishop, can... and we've already gone past yeah. this. So Hensi learns of Virginia abuse because there were uh, two brothers who were abused of yours, right, Rebecca? And they were in two different states. That's the abuse happening. So then there's mm -hmm. two different jurisdictions that have been involved in prosecuting Sean Gooden over yeah. this. And that gets a little bit confusing. But Virginia was the first one that was disclosed yeah. by your brother, I think, probably to your mom and what the initial disclosure was about and what was admitted to by your husband to stake President Hensi. Um, can you get that back up there for a second there, uh, Maven? Okay, so well, over there, Hensi learns of Vir uh, Virginia abuse. Go ahead and uh, do whatever it is you need to do that to make that line continue. Secretly excommunicated. It was put a blanket over so that uh, very few people would know that it had happened. And Sean Gooden remains uh, continuing to attend church with access mm -hmm. to uh, anybody, pretty much anybody there, because nobody knows about it except for a select few. So there's a picture on the left of President Hensi, and on the right is Sean Gooden. And then the secret excommunication, if you can go to that one. We just got a little bit ahead of our timeline, and I want to make sure we catch yeah. up. Sorry, I don't I don't have that one. I just lead it to the slides where we didn't have like a, a picture. So, OK, yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, go ahead and, and uh, bring that up as soon as we get to the next point in it, because I know you did a lot of work on this and it looks great, Maven. Thank you so much. Can I say okay. something really quick, RFM? Please do. Can we go, um, Maven, is there a way to go back to his callings for just a second? By the way, I'm. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that there's this. Yeah. When you look at those callings, and uh, sorry, I'm a little, the Elder Iring in his talk, The Lord Leads His Church, right? It takes faith to believe he calls imperfect people into positions of trust. It takes faith to believe that he knows the people he calls perfectly, both their capacities and their potential, and so makes no mistakes in his calls. I just want to say, because some of Rebecca's comments were sort of touching to me, when we have this aura of silence in Mormonism. You don't allow, you don't allow any accountability or awareness to other people who could also be victims, people who could also have been hurt in the process. And then you tell this story that all the people called are, uh, that God doesn't make any mistakes. Hence, God wanted this human being in all of those callings. And that just doesn't make sense on any level. Um, this attitude of silence in the church, I think, is just deeply damaging, and you can see in this story firsthand why. Yeah, well, thank you, Bill. Um, so 2021 rolls along from January to December. That's 2021. Now 2022 comes up. What is it that happens next in the sequence of events in 2022? Because I know that in September, Sean gets arrested. Yeah, so one of the things that Sean is doing is, you know, um, he says that, you know, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to help um, my brothers to heal. And so one of the things that suggested is counseling. And so he starts paying for their counseling um, and they start going to see a counselor and um, they tell the counselor what happened. And so the counselor, who is a mandatory reporter, um, tells the police in Virginia and also tells Child Protective Services in Pennsylvania um, because um, there's a minor, Jacob, I mean, it was he was 17-ish, seven, he, he wasn't yet 18. Right. Um, and so he was still a minor. Um, and so... Um, so your brother is in counseling, being paid for mm -hmm. by Sean, your husband mm -hmm. at the time. And he, of course, tells the counselor what happens. The counselor, who's a mandatory reporter, does what she's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And she contacts law enforcement and also contacts Child Protective Services, who I'm sure came out and did a sweep of your house because you've got a minor still in the house, even though he's only 17. They didn't come to the house. They pulled him out of class and, at school and talked to him. And just asked him, you know, how are things going? Anything weird at home? Anyone ever? I mean, I don't know exactly what they said, but just kind of general yes. just make sure it's all right okay all right so that started an investigation at least in virginia 
of your mm -hmm. husband. Do you remember? Actually, I think that started around March of 2022, if I recall I correctly. I've been looking at the, the reports, and I know it had to take a, a certain amount of time before they were ready to file charges and arrest him in September. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So what is the next thing that happens to your knowledge? I mean, are you and Sean, he's got to be aware at some point that there's an investigation going on. Um, I mean, so when the Child Protective Services came to talk to Jacob, um, I, it was the first that we knew that anyone knew. Um, I, but the, we didn't know there was a, an invest, a police investigation until just before he was arrested. Okay. The prosecutor or somebody in, or an uh, agent, somebody in Virginia called the house or left a message on his phone and just said, I'm from Prince William County. I have some questions for you. And he started to panic. He was like, this, this can't be good. And then what and, but that was just, that was just like a couple days before he was arrested. Then Labor Day weekend, the police showed up at our front door and he was arrested. If I, if I remember correctly, he had said that he wanted to talk to his attorney before answering any of the police's questions. And so I think that that's what led to expedited police action to arrest him when they did. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how they decide when or how to arrest somebody, but they asked uh, if he would be willing to come down to Virginia to ask, answer some questions on the message. Mm -hmm. And then, but before that could even happen, the policeman came and arrested him. All right. Now we also have this timeline because September of 2022 is going to be uh, an important month with a lot of important dates in it for purposes of our discussion. Maven, do you have that uh, that next slide? And if you're there, Maven, can you tell us what this is? I know it's the good and the rest becomes public September 13th. He was arrested earlier of that month, like yeah. you said, on Labor so Day. Th so this one, I kind of skips mm -hmm. forward to just because, yeah, I didn't have a separate slide for the arrest part. But um, but this, this is the first article that I'm aware of that uh, breaks the story, September 13th. And then um, there were more after that. The next one, this one came out on the... 14th so and this was it's funny this was lebanon daily news so it's ld news i kept thinking it was lds news like as i was seeing the link over and over so um oh sorry i can i can show my face um anyway yeah so th this is when it breaks that's that's basically it okay so he's arrested probably around the 5th of september it's not in the news until the 13th and the 14th of september and now State President Hensey springs into action. I'm going to tell everybody right now that we have a separate member of the Harrisburg stake who's in the green room. He's going to come in at the end. Uh, he's not associated with his family, just happens to be a member of the stake. The stake president sent out an email to everybody in the stake, which was kind of generic, and we'll read that email at the end of the show. And then this other individual, his name's Steve, at least that's what we're calling him tonight, this other member of the Harrisburg stake. And we have the emails between him and stake president Hensey in which Steve basically shames him into giving more information to all the members of the ward so they can ask some questions of their kids and make sure everything's okay. All right. So we're going to come back to that, but I want to talk about the email that stake president Hensey sent your then husband, Sean Gooden, after this story went public. And this is almost two full years after state president Hensey mm -hmm. knows about what happened, isn't it? Yeah. So up until this point, he was allowed to go to church. There was no restrictions. I mean, he couldn't take the sacrament. He couldn't say prayers like, you know, someone who's been excommunicated, but there were no other restrictions on anything that he was doing. Okay. And we do, are going to go ahead and so, let's read this one. This was the one that he sent around to everybody in the stake after it went public so it goes public september 13th and 14th in the news september 17th oh and of course i mean rumors yeah, start flying in the stake i mean something Should like that doesn't Steve happen up? without people finding out and people talking and there's a lot of people are talking and wondering what's going on with sean gooden shall we bring steve up um to to read these yeah, why don't we, ha and uh, just this one, because we're going to loop back and go into his others with the state president okay, at the gotcha. end of the show, but we can, we can go over this one. And Steve, would you go ahead and read this, uh, sure. this email? You got a copy of this along with everybody else in your state, correct? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, right. Okay, so 
Harrisburg, Pennsylvania stake. As some of you are already aware, a former member of the church in our stake has been arrested and is in custody for child abuse over 20 years ago in Virginia. Uh, the church's position is that abuse cannot be tolerated in any form, and we take reports of abuse seriously and never disregard them. We encourage your review of information and resources found on, found on the church website and also encourage parents to teach information and skills appropriate to their age and maturity so they will know what to do if faced with abuse. Uh, hey, Maven, I think that this is out of, out of order. I think that this is a follow-up email. Oh, sorry. But, Let me get that fixed. Sorry, guys. One moment. Okay. You know, I, the first I may one be was really brief, wasn't that it? That is the first. Yeah, I thought the first one was very brief. Yeah. Well, we'll get that figured out here. Okay. And so we're, we're just going to read the one that went out to everybody in the stake. And then we'll circle around and um, we'll come back to that again because we want to talk about the email that stake president Hensey sent directly to Sean Gooden. And I think that was on the 19th. Maven, if you're having trouble with that, we can loop back to that at the end, and that way you can work on it in the meantime. Oh, you know, hey, I, I'm wrong. It just looks different on my screen. It, yeah, okay. Yeah, right sorry. I, I, I was apologize. looking. I was pulling it back up from the email. This is what I have as the first one. Yeah, sorry about yeah. that. All right, I'll, I'll continue. Uh, any known past or current abuse should be reported. As we anchor our faith in the Savior and his gospel, we can weather challenging moments when we may not know the answer to all things and question how and why. In Gethsemane and on Calvary, Jesus took upon himself all of the anguish and suffering ever experienced by you and me, and he has overcome it all. With arms outstretched, the Savior offers the gift of healing to all. The victims and families affected warrant our prayers, love, and kindness. If you have questions, reports of abuse, or any other related concerns, please contact a member of the state presidency. Mm. Well, there, that's very few facts in that. The only facts yeah. I can see in that are about is some of you are already aware, just in the first part, a former member of the church, which most of you are not going to know is a former member of the church because we kept his excommunication with a blanket over it, so you wouldn't know. But a former member of the church and our stake has been arrested and is in custody for child abuse over 20 years ago in Virginia. No mention of who it was who was arrested in this. And I know that that's going to be what you talk to the state president about, but with your emails, Steve. Yeah. Okay. So that's what goes out set, uh, September 17th. And actually, as long as we've got this up here, why don't we just go ahead and read your responses okay. and your uh, back and forth to the, um, the state president, Steve. So just to, to preface this, I got that email just like everyone else in the stake and, uh, and it didn't answer the questions that I had. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't, think that it was I don't think that it was enough information for the people in the stake um oh there it is okay I, all I saw was my face for a second there um so I emailed him back I said President Hensey your email raises more questions than it answers the members of the affected ward and stake deserve to have more information so they can determine the potential scope of this person's abuse in the Harrisburg stake and take appropriate action specifically what is the name of the person who was arrested? This is a matter of public record since he was arrested, and there is no ethical prohibition on sharing it. Uh, second one, since they are a quote unquote former member, how recently were they a member and ward attendee? Third, were they in a position of trust over children or teens in the ward or stake? That is, what callings did they hold? Fourth, did they have access to children? whether as a part of their callings or even just in passing, abuse can occur in seconds and not just behind closed doors. And last, what specific steps is the church taking to make sure his abuse did not continue in the Harrisburg area? And it is your moral obligation to arm the members of the ward and stake with the information they need to make sure their children were not abused. Jesus himself said that it would be better that a millstone be hung around one's neck and be thrown into the sea than harm a child. Please gather the above information and pass it on to the ward and stake members so they can protect their children. It is important that this information comes from you rather than just circulate through the rumor mill. Can I just say, Steve, thanks for having the fortitude to, to take action and to write that message. 
I, I want to give a shout out to Colby Reddish, whose uh, story I had watched on Mormon Stories. He gave me the courage to do it uh, by his example. Wow. Shout out to Colby. Okay. So did you get a reply from the stake president? Uh, I got a reply. <laughs> yes. Right. Because this is just between you and him now. Yes. He, he, I replied directly to him. He replied only to me. He said, thank you for reaching out. The arrest was of Sean Gooden, who lives in Palmyra for abuse in Virginia over 20 years ago. He remains in custody awaiting extradition to Virginia. And then he links to the news article about it. And I think I had already read that article at that point. By the way, that's Palmyra, Pennsylvania, correct? Yes. Okay. So did you respond to him? I did. He, still, did hadn't you? he still hadn't answered my questions. Uh, I said, President Hensey, thank you for your brief response. And I was kind of poking him there. Uh, to be clear, this is only a part of the necessary information, and it should be sent to all members of the stake, not just those who reach out to you to get it. Uh, it should be broadcast in the same way that your original email was so that all stake members get the necessary information and can make an informed decision on what actions to take. I'm kind of restating what I said in the, in the previous email. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that the sexual abuse was over 20 years ago or in Virginia is a deflection from the importance of informing the stake. A one-off email to me is not sufficient and does not satisfy your moral obligation to provide all members of the stake with the information they need to make sure their children are not also victims of his abuse. <clears throat> Excuse me. Further, I find it very disheartening that in your response to me, you chose to omit the fact that he was Bishop of the Lebanon Ward for over four years. Uh, that is information that was not in the news link you sent, and you definitely knew was highly relevant to this to the discussion, since as Bishop, he would have had unfettered access to children and teens in one on one interviews behind closed doors. I realize you likely have legal counsel because my understanding of the playbook is that he would have talked to Curtin McConkie at this point. I realize that you likely have legal counsel from the church providing you with talking points. Their advice may satisfy the letter of the law, but it does not relieve you of your moral obligation to the members of the stake. And I here I reemphasize, please do your moral duty and protect the children. Let all members of the stake know who this person is, his positions in the church, and that they should contact law enforcement first, <clears throat> first if they suspect he may have abused their children. And that was the response to his saying, contact the state presidency, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I was, so. I was pretty fired up at that point. Apparently, and this is all happening in one day's time. This is all on September 17th of 2022. Yeah, yeah correct. And then he responded. Uh, he responded. Yes, he responded to me with the thank you for your input, which I, I thought he was giving me the kiss off, but... But uh, fortunately, shortly after he sent that email to me, he sent a follow-up email to, to the entire stake. And which you said, caused, by the way, which you caused. I think I, ahead, I, I, read I think that. I can claim that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania stake, brothers and sisters, to follow up on our previous communication, the individual referenced is Sean Gooden, a former leader of our stake and the and the Lebanon ward, who has been arrested and is in custody for child abuse. If there is any suspected or discovered abuse in this or in any other matter, and this time he says something different, please contact law enforcement, mm. not, not the state presidency. He took that from you. As we gather together on the Sabbath day, we can come together to show love and support to one another and seek the healing only the Savior can provide. Please continue to reflect on our earlier message about the clear direction from our Savior and the church to not tolerate abuse in any form. If you have any questions, please contact me contact a member of the state presidency okay that, that, that was the that last was the, one, end right? of the, the end of the communications between him and me and i'm sorry there's uh by the way bravo bravo to you Thank steve you. there's something in me and if we can bring the other people on too if that's okay there's just something in me that strikes me as wrong that state president hincy is now after knowing about this since october of 2020 is now in september of 2022 uh, writing that the church doesn't tolerate child abuse in any form. And there's something that seems yeah. contradictory to me about that. I'm wondering if anybody else is sensing that. Rebecca, Matthew, 
Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing that I had always thought about this was that it felt like President Tensi was just covering his bases. He needed to make sure that the image of the church was protected above all else. And so I think that his line of thinking back in 2020, when this came out to him, was if it becomes aware, then that's going to look bad on the church because a high ranking member of the Lebanon ward is being excommunicated for abuse. And so better to keep that hidden now. And then when this became public in 2022, he thought, well, now it's bad. We've got several different news outlets talking about the abuse. The rumor mill is circulating across the ward and the stake. And if I say nothing, then I either look negligent or potentially culpable is what I would think if that were to be the case. So best to send out this communication now, which basically just covers his bases and says, yeah, we are aware of it. And we are just going to do the generic plug and go of, if you know anything about the abuse, contact us, contact authorities. We're wiping our hands clean of any potential responsibility in this moment. Yes. RFM? Yes. It seems to me that across the entire church, that if the protocol is to handle the discipline of child abusers in the shadows, that that seems like a direct contradiction to the idea that we don't tolerate abuse. Because when you, when you have a system of silence, when it's systemic silence and obfuscation is the wrong word, but, but sort of leaving it in the dark, as Rebecca Biblioteca pointed out, and as I think Steve is, deeply hit on with his messages to the stake president. One never knows what the reach is of the harm that's been done to others. And without speaking out loud, there's no way to have there be accountability where a parent gets informed and goes, Hey, my child was in unsafe spaces with compromised boundaries with that person I need to be able to have the space to go check the wherewithal, the awareness to, to go ask and to check. And I think the church has to stop this thing where it does both the silent treatment around those who are abusers and claiming that it doesn't tolerate abuse because those don't go together. Thank you. That is the contradiction I'm sensing. Thanks for giving it voice. Um, anybody else want to comment on that before we get to the next email? Okay. I'll comment more after the next email. <laughs> okay, because this is a shocker. This is a really a shocker to me, but I'll just go ahead and read this because not only was Stake President Hinsey sending out emails to the stake and engaging in this correspondence with Steve, which Steve caused, he also on September 19th, Sorry, I'm I'm weeks. gonna interrupt RFM. Yeah. I left this one off. Um, this was I just thought it was a class act of Steve to to thank and acknowledge um President NC for for doing that. So that was one I missed. The other one we're not going to have on on screen. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, RFM. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, we're not putting this on the screen, and uh, that's at the request of the guests, which we're going to honor here. But this is an email which I have a hard copy of in front of me, which I'm going to read word for word at this point. So this is an email that was sent by Rhett Hinsey on Monday, September 19th, 2022, at 5:33 p.m. It's addressed to Sean Gooden, and I believe it was CC'd also probably to the current bishop. I'm guessing that's who that name is. Yeah. And the subject was follow up and guidance. So this is now 23 months after President Hintzey knows about what happened with Sean Gooden and Rebecca's brothers. But now he's going to leap into action because it's hit the news. Sean, comma, I understand that you have been released from detention and await further court proceedings in the Virginia-based case that was made public in the press, both in Virginia, Virginia and here in central Pennsylvania, after you were taken into custody. Though I am not aware of any general restrictions currently placed upon you regarding contact with others and or minors. And by the way, of course he's not aware of any general restrictions because he didn't put any restrictions on him when he found out about it 23 months earlier. But I digress. Though I am not aware of any general restrictions of that type, 
until court proceedings are completed, I ask that you not attend any church, ward, or stake meetings, whether in the building or outside of the building. So now it's time to protect the kids. Forgive my editorial comments. Please also do not make any contact in person, phone, social, etc., with any minors of families in the church, because now we're going to look after the minors now that it's hit the news after two years. And I advise against attending any other church meeting or event that may be held by any other unit of the church. The bishop has been authorized to, pro to provide you a Zoom link to watch sacrament meeting if that is desired. I encourage you to fully cooperate with law enforcement in this matter. Because of your past positions in the stake and ward, a communication was sent out to all adult members of the stake this past weekend informing those who had not already learned from news reports of your arrest. The following comments were included in the stake-wide communication, which completely applies to you too as you seek resolution and healing through the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ. And here he quotes from the first email he sent out. As we anchor our faith in the Savior and his gospel, we can weather challenging moments when we may not know the answer to all things and question how and why. In Gethsemane and on Calvary, Jesus took upon himself all of the anguish and suffering ever experienced by you and me, and he has overcome it all. With arms outstretched, the Savior offers the gift of healing to all. The victims and families affected warrant our prayers, love, and kindness, period. End of him quoting himself. Sincerely, Red Hensey, President, Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, Stake. Rebecca, what comments did you have about that email? So I have, <laughs> I have a lot of comments about that email. Um, so, Let it so all out. First, <laughs> so first, I want to, you know, after he was arrested and after some other things have happened, looking back, I can see that the um, church and the legal department was probably, you know, involved back in March and April. Because at one point, President Hensey had asked Sean if, if turning yourself in were required as part of the repentance process, would you turn yourself in? He asked him that question at one point. He also asked uh, when Sean had mentioned that Child Protective Services had come to talk to our youngest. He said, do you have a copy of that report? I'd like to see that. Um, and so just little things were being, you're muted. I won't, I won't rest till everybody in the world actually tells that to me at one time or other. <laughs> I, I apologize. So who was that President Hensey who was asking to see the referral or someone else? President Hensey. Yeah, the CPS referral, President Hensey wanted to see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so, like I said, President Hensey had not talked to me or my children or anyone else this entire time. He had been fine with Sean coming to church. And then, so when he said that, then Sean was arrested and, you know, the um, bishop, I think, under the direction of President Hensey, was very interested in how long he was there, when he was getting transferred, where he was all the things. And then when he was released, they, they asked me, um, you know, what were the, the terms of his release? Was there a bond? Was there restrictions? Did he, was he under house arrest or, you know, all the, whatever. And there wasn't, there was not one restriction. He wasn't. There was no restrictions after he, did he bail out or did they just release him on his personal recognizance? They just let him out. With no conditions, like no contact with minors? No conditions. Wow. What uh -uh. goes on in Pennsylvania? And I'm looking well, at this you guys. This is Virginia. Oh, Virginia. Okay. Yeah. They would never do something that crazy in Pennsylvania. Only in Virginia do they do things like that. Okay. So he's, he's out. He's uh, while yeah. charges are pending. Okay. And, no and so I, so I think it, it was a, my impression at the time that when president Hensey in that email said no conditions, he was referring to the, um, from the state of Virginia. Mm -hmm. He was saying, since there were no conditions set on you by the state, this is a conditions that I think you should have, I guess. Okay. Um, but in, you know, I, I thought to myself, nothing's changed. I mean, President Hensey has known all of the information this whole time. Mm -hmm. And so if he really is trying to protect the children, he should have done that on day one. Those should have been the restrictions in place 
as soon as Sean went into his office and told him what happened, as soon as my brother said, this is what happened to me, that should have been the restriction immediately. And if you weren't going to put it then, then why, why now? I mean, Virginia trusts him enough to let him go with, with nothing. So why all of a sudden it was only because he wanted to, you know, he wanted to look like he was doing something. Right. And I think that he's never cared about the kids at all. It's been from the beginning In fact, let's protect the church and let's try and make the church look as good as we possibly can. And now that once it goes public after two years of state mm -hmm. president, hence he's knowing about it. Now it makes the church look better to not have him around anymore. So he can't go to church. And my kids had a really hard time with it. One of my kids reached out to President Hensi and said, I don't understand what what is going on. Why all of a sudden, what, what changed? What? And he replied in a very succinct text that said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I, and wouldn't talk to her. And then I re reached out and I was like, I don't understand. What do you mean you won't talk to us? And he sent me the same word for word text. And at that point I thought, you're getting this from a lawyer. <laughs> so he has not spoken to me, I mean, in a really long time, but he has refused to talk to me since Sean was arrested. Wow. And how does that make you feel? By the way, Matthew, you're on deck. So I'm going to be asking you about your thoughts about this here in a second, as soon as your mom's done. Sounds good. It just makes me feel like he, he doesn't care about me or my kids or the victims or the other kids at the church or. Well, he wrote a lot of nice stuff in that email to Sean. Yeah. A lot of ministering Christian uh, language. It sounds like he's there for Sean, just not for you or your kids. Is that fair to say? You know, I don't want to, I, I really don't want to judge. I just want to let everyone know the timeline. <laughs> Okay, very you know, there close. was there was a lot of there has been a lot of misinformation, you know, like people thought that, you know, President Hensi must have just found out when Sean was arrested and he was just then excommunicated or, you know, there's been a lot of information and a lot of misinformation. So really, I just want to let everybody know the timeline and the truth and then everyone can come to their own ideas of what everybody Matthew, believes. I'm going to put you on hold for just a second, but Rebecca, is there anything else since you brought it up? You said there's a lot of misinformation that's been out there. Is there anything else that you want to correct at this point as far as misinformation? Um, I mean, I can't, I don't know. Really, nobody talks to me, so I don't know. I mean, I just hear little bits of things. Um, I really, the community, my community has been very loving and kind to my children. I really appreciate that. Our bishop has been wonderful and kind to our family. Um, so there have been a handful of people that really, without them, I, we couldn't have, have made it through this. So I really love them and the rest, I guess, doesn't matter. Okay. Matthew, what were your thoughts? So I have a lot of thoughts about President Hensi and what he's not done for my family. My first thought when I had first found out about everything was if President Hensi knew since 2021, why hadn't he done anything for my siblings? I had been on the other side of the country at school at the time, so I knew I wasn't any potential danger. And I didn't think that my dad was necessarily a threat to anyone, but that was before I heard about that. And so when I had heard that my dad had done these things, he wasn't trying to deny it, at least anyone in our family. I thought, why didn't anyone think to check in on my brother? He's almost the same age as my uncles when they were abused. So that would be the prime time to check on that because it would most likely be very, very recent if he was following a similar type of MO. And then the other thing that just really got me mad was how clinical and distant he was to my mom. My thoughts regarding this was that we hear about how bishops and state presidents, they're supposed to take care of the widows in their congregations. 
I get my mom is not a widow, but for all intents and purposes, the breadwinner of her household had just been arrested and then subsequently fired from his job. There wasn't really any financial security that she could bank on in the near future from that. There was a lot of emotional and spiritual uh, challenges that were facing our family because of that. And so my thought would be that in that kind of situation, the stake president should be the first person to check up on my mom and my family to make sure that she is holding up all right. And for him to just sort of say, not only, sorry, I didn't reach out earlier, sorry, I couldn't help with this, but to just say, for my own well-being, I'm not going to talk to you or your family, just makes it feel like he shouldn't hold that type of office. If he's worried for legal reasons that he can't communicate with people in his state that need his help, he shouldn't be the state president. Should be an automatic disqualifier. And I would like to say when, when he talks about not taking care of our family, we our bishop has been wonderful. I don't want to make it sound like nobody has taken care of us. Right, because yes. the bishop. Our bishop, well, my mom's bishop, he has been phenomenal. Every time I've come and visited my family since my dad's arrest, I have found him at some point or time making a visit. Mm -hmm. I know that he checks in with my brother regularly, makes sure that he's doing all right. I know he checks in with my mom. And so that bishop has done a really good job of helping my But even the, the bishop, even the bishop didn't, wasn't checking in until the arrest because he didn't know. Mm -hmm. He didn't know that there was a need. You know, right, he didn't know right. why why Sean was excommunicated. Rebecca, did you make any efforts to find out what was going on? What had really gone on, the details that you were trying to find out beyond just asking the state president and his rebuffing you and not talking to you? Yeah, so I asked him and he sent me, you know, a pretty standard email. Sorry, I can't help you until the legal whatever is over. And I said, if you can't talk to me, then I want the number um, to the Area 70. I want someone who can talk to me because this is my life and I, I want answers. I want to know what what's going on. Um, and so he sent me the, I think he sent me the email. And so I reached out to the Area 70 and he called me one day and we had a long conversation. You know, and I started, it was probably naive of me to think that he didn't know the whole story already. Um, Cause he did, but I went through and I told him the story and how I didn't understand. And he just said, I, there's nothing I can add to that at that, at this time. I don't, I don't, there's nothing else I can tell you. And I said, what, well, I don't understand. Why won't you talk to me? And he said, why do you think? And I said, because there's lawyers involved. And he said, yes. Can I just note, I put up on the screen, several screenshots of the church's website about how abuse is to be handled. The, rhetoric it sends out to the world to say how we handle abuse there's a deep discrepancy between how much it claims that what local leaders should be doing is helping the family and victims of abuse while at the same time the actual risk management handbook is that we create a wall of distance so that uh that so that there is as little transparency and as much withholding of information uh, as possible. And again, I just want to note the way the church operates versus how it tells the world it operates. There is a significant discrepancy and it is dishonest. And I just wanted to say, you know, I have stayed quiet this whole time. I just, my focus has been my kids. They've, you know, it was like a bomb went off in our house and we just didn't know how to cope and what to do. We didn't have any help. And I just, kept to myself and I wanted to make sure that my kids were okay because they they didn't have anybody they needed they needed me and so that has been my focus and I have been quiet and I haven't really haven't said anything to anyone um but when the church came out and said that they were vigorously defending President Hensey that he didn't do anything wrong that was where I thought this was your chance this is your chance to stay no, this wasn't handled right. And we're sorry. We're sorry to the victims. We're sorry to the families. We're sorry to the ward that we didn't tell you. And and they didn't. Instead, they said they're going to vigorously defend the person who didn't, who kept everybody in the dark. And I just thought somebody just, somebody, and 
I, I'm really the only one that knows the whole story. I mean, I don't know the whole story because I wasn't in all the rooms, but somebody has to come and just say that that's not how it happened. Well, let's go ahead and fast forward and let me know if I'm skipping anything because mainly mm -hmm. uh, your husband gets arrested back in September of 2022 and mm -hmm. in 2023 go, comes along. And basically, mm -hmm. I think in the summer of 2023, he reaches a plea bargain with um, the Virginia case and he enters that plea and is sentenced mm -hmm. and maybe a week later, Pennsylvania files charges against him. Uh, has that been resolved? Has that been taken care of the Pennsylvania case? No, it has not. It's still pending. Yes, and I really don't know any of the details. I, okay. I know that the 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 Pennsylvania charge that is just one victim. It's the same. It is one of my brothers. Um, same time frame. It was just in a different state. Um, so then we go through 2023, and I'm trying to catch up to you, mm -hmm. uh, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. So 20, uh, no, no, no. 2024, this year, this last month, finally now, State President Hensey gets charged with failing to report, and that hits the news on January 31st, I believe. Do we have that article? J January, not July. What did, did you say? Did I say July? He said oh. January. Oh, good. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Because um, <laughs> I've been known to do things like that. You know, <laughs> start with Jay. Anyway, so January, yes, this past month, uh, 31st, that's the date that was on, uh, there was another article, but, uh, yeah, it's at the very bottom, that tiny, tiny print, January 31st, 2024 daily news by David Matthews, where it says a Mormon church leader in new Cumberland, Pennsylvania has been charged with not reporting sexual abuse allegations against another leader in the church. Red Hensey, a stake president at seven church of Jesus Christ and latter day saint locations. Okay. Cause he's a stake president in the state was charged Wednesday with failure to report or refer allegations that were made against Sean Corey Gooden, an LDS official and Boy Scout leader, who was accused of abusing at least two victims in the 1990s and early 2000s. Gooden, a leader with the church's Lebanon ward, was charged in separate cases in Virginia in 2022 and Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2023 with sexually assaulting a minor, ABC 27 reported. Pennsylvania State Police said another assault was alleged to have occurred at a state park. Okay, so he gets charged with that. And now the church loses no time in rushing to the podium. The very next church meeting, which would have been, I think, the first Sunday in February and therefore fast and testimony meeting. But we played this recording before. I want to play it again in this chronology because some perspicacious soul recorded it when I think it's the second counselor in the state presidency and president Hensey is still the state president. He may have been relieved of duty at his job, but he's still the state president. So do we have that recording of what the state, uh, the second counselor in the state presidency said to one ward in the stake the Sunday after it hit the news that president Hensey had been charged with failing to report. Um, with the audio, I think I think this PR statement came out first. Um, okay. I I thought we could go over this first, if that's all right. Could you read? I, it? I'll go ahead and read it. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints works actively to prevent abuse. Church spokesman Sam Penrod said in a statement, "Our hearts ache for victims of abuse, and the church is committed to addressing such incidents wherever they are found." The church trains, trains its leaders and supports their lawful efforts. The charges now brought by local prosecutors for failing to report the abuse are misguided and the church will vigorously defend them. I think we've referenced it a few times, but I just mm -hmm. this is when it came out. So, yes. So let's go ahead and let's play the um, the audio then, which is basically this is the second counselor in the state presidency reading a prepared statement from the church, probably from church legal. So, I'm going to turn time over to President Johnson, uh, following him, then we'll have an opening hymn number 70, sing praise to him, and our opening invocation will be by Brother Kalali. Uh, Brothers and sisters, many of you are aware that the uh, state police uh, this past week charged uh, President Hensey with the failure to believe, failure to uh, report uh, 
information about an abuse situation that was given to him when he was acting as clergy as a state president. And there's been a lot of information that's been out on the internet and causing, uh, causing questions. Um, the article spell mentioned that uh, based on the research and the uh, position the church has that President Hint in this particular situation did not have discretion or the, was not permitted to report that particular information. Uh, this particular situation occurred over over 20 years ago. The, uh, the victims of the abuse are uh, over 30 years old right now. And, uh, and they've been asked to, uh, they've asked us to read a statement. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints works actively to prevent abuse. Our hearts ache for victims of abuse and the church is committed to addressing such incidents wherever they are found. The church trains its leaders and supports their lawful efforts. The charges now brought by local prosecutors for failing to report the abuse are misguided and the church will vigorously uh, defend him. Uh, the situation is much more uh, complicated legally than the information you're reading on the internet would, would lead you to believe. One thing I can tell you is that the Elder Cook, member of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles, has been actively monitoring and watching what is uh, what is going on. Uh, president Haney, who is the president of the area where we live, uh, General Authority 70, has also thoroughly reviewed the situation. He's talked with all the lawyers involved. And the counsel we've been given is that we move forward, we continue to have our meetings, continue to work, and that all of this will be resolved appropriately, and that it's in Heavenly Father's hands, and that we're to have confidence in our church leaders and understand that everything that President Hensey did was fully approved by the church. He followed uh, appropriate legal protocols, and that. Uh, and that he's done the uh, everything that he, that he was supposed to have done. Thank you. I want to go to Matthew first and ask, were you present in church? No, you're not in Pennsylvania. When you found out about this and heard this recording, what were your thoughts, Matthew? Then I'll go to Rebecca and then Steve. I was, again, really, really pissed. There was one thing in particular that really stood out to me right there at the end where the church statement, I'm assuming that entire recording was a prepared statement from the church, is it says the church approves of everything that Tensi has done. And my thought to that is in the church is approving of everything. And I'm assuming that he's acting on the guidance of the higher ups and church lawyers. Then the church has approved of his two year silence. They've approved of him trying to save the face of the church when there's clear wrong, it's completely ignoring the church's teachings on repentance and seeking forgiveness. It approves of the way that he neglected to look out for my siblings or my mom after everything that had happened. And I just can't possibly fathom that a church that claims to be representing Jesus Christ could ever possibly in a million years approve something like that. Your thoughts, Rebecca? Um, thank you, Matthew, for saying that. That's nice. Um, I don't want anyone to feel bad for me or that I'm a victim in any way. I'm, I'm good. Um, but I, Matthew, Matthew likes to look out for me. <laughs> um, it's my job. The one thing that stood out to me was when he said that this issue is so much more complicated than you could possibly understand. And so I, again, that's one of the reasons I wanted to come on. It's, it's not complicated. <laughs> I want to let everybody know the timeline so that, you know, then you can decide for yourself. You don't have to, I don't know. It's just, it's not complicated. It's a, yes. this is, this is the timeline. Everybody can understand it and make a decision. You don't have to just blindly believe anything. Um, yeah. Oh. Mormonism, think, making simple things complicated since 1830. Mm -hmm. Matthew, did you have a tagline you wanted to add on? Then we'll go. Oh, I, oh, I just wanted to say that it is complicated, just not for anyone trying to follow along. It's complicated for the church and its legal department to try to make sense of everything. 
Yeah. And, and there's complicated oh, yeah. emotions. I mean, I, I yeah. think we really need to focus on the victims and helping healing and, and, and not focus on, I don't know. It, there's just more important things to focus on. We need to be taking care of the victims and the children and making sure this doesn't happen. And I am struck with the, the disparity between how it took almost two full years to get the state president dragged to making an email about the situation, even a, a vague email to the members of the stake. Otherwise it was kept hush hush, but the state president gets charged. And three days later, the very next Sunday, they're, making church announcements at the pulpit to all the members of the stake. Steve, your thoughts. Oh, and there's, um, now is that, uh, that's President Hincy, isn't it? No, that's not Hincy, that's Haney. And somebody reminded us, that's the comic books and classic cars guy. Yeah, that's Mr. Haney. Oh. Those are the things that have more worth years down the road other than dead profits, more worth than dead profits. See, okay, now, Steve, Rebecca, and Matthew, are you aware of what Bill's talking about? Yeah. Steve, yeah, is aware. Rebecca, Matthew? Yeah, I'm aware. I've okay. been keeping up with what's going on in the church, so I remember yeah. the controversy around his talk very well. Yes. Okay, so he's he's talked to all the lawyers, according to the statement, and the good news is that Elder Cook is observing from a distance. God is watching from a distance. Okay, so Steve, your thoughts. Okay, so I, I had a few thoughts. It, if it's complicated, it's because so much of it has been hidden. It's easy to make sense of things when they're in plain sight in front of you, and it's difficult to solve a puzzle in the dark. Um, and then the other part that stood out to me is that phrase, our hearts ache for victims of abuse. Well, while we were talking here, I just did a quick search for that phrase on Google, and it is straight out of the playbook. Anytime that that a uh, the someone high up in leadership has been caught abusing Sterling Van Wagenen, for instance, a um, couple others. I didn't read it thoroughly, but yeah, that's their 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 catchphrase that they use. And can I just note that maybe more than any institution in this country. The church has more money, has enough money to handle every one of these cases in an appropriate manner. Yeah, and I think if your heart aches for anybody, you could you could demonstrate that emotion in a better way than copy and paste. Yeah, and silence and uh, ignoring the problem. I mean, my gosh, I try and do that when I'm writing Christmas cards. I don't try and write exactly the same thing to everybody, right? I try and do something a little bit personal. But they're happy with a copy and paste. Our hearts ache every time this happens. So we are in a situation here where we're going to follow what's happening with President Hensey in his case and how the church is going to try and file a motion, I'm sure, to dismiss based upon their interpretation of the law. And the prosecutor will file a response. We'll have to see what the judge does with it. But I want to thank all three of you for coming on the show tonight. Uh, it's been very important what we've talked about, I think, what you've talked about, Matthew, Rebecca, and Steve. And I want to give you this chance to say any last words you'd like to our audience. And if you need a prompt, if you need a prompt for that, I would ask you to answer the question, what would you tell President Nelson or any person in authority, what would you tell them that they should do so that this situation is not as bad as it was for you. And we'll start with Matthew and go to Rebecca and Steve. Yeah, so I think to address the prompt first, I think that the answer to it is simple. I think that the church needs to just live up to basic standards of protection and care. We hear so often that there are cases like this that go unknown for so long and the church doesn't have any sort of safeguards whatsoever most organizations you'll at least have a background check of some nature to make sure that you're at least vetting out prior offenders the church doesn't even have that um, there's no 
real protocol to make sure that individual leaders aren't in the room alone with children. Uh, for example, bishops, right? They're always behind closed doors talking with children and oftentimes talking about things that can turn to a sexual nature and talking about the law of chastity. And so just simple things like a buddy system when it comes to adults with children is something that can go a long way and is common sense for 99% of the world, I feel. And yet the church with all of its leaders who claim to have revelation direct from God can't seem to come to that consensus that these are good basic steps to take. And so I think in this case, it's get off your podium and listen at least a little bit to what everyone else has been doing so far to address abuse within the church, create these practical safeguards to make sure that this isn't happening anymore. Okay, Rebecca. Um, so first I wanted to say, since I, I'm able to talk to more than just my family, um, I'm really grateful first to all of my friends and the people that have supported my family through this because we really have felt a lot of love from the community and from our friends. It's amazing how you find out who your who your real friends are when something bad happens. And so I am grateful and we are doing, we're doing well. We're, we're moving on and we're good. Um, as far as the, I think it's really important that we have mandatory reporters. I think when someone you know, I'm, I'm sure that there's lots of women out there that like me that have been in this situation and you don't know what to do because nobody talks about it. Um, I'm sure there's there are other wives and they are finding these things out and they don't know what to do. And that's why we have mandatory reporters. You know, like I said, it was like a bomb went off in our house and I didn't know. I, I, I was confused. I didn't know this person that I was supposed to have been trusted for 27 years. 25 years of that time, I just couldn't comprehend it all. It was just so, so, so much. Um, and so I was quiet and I wanted to protect my kids. Um, and that's why we have mandatory reporters because when the people that are going through the trauma or the abuse or the chaos, it can't think straight sometimes. And that's why it's important that we have mandatory reporters. Somebody in, you know, and as an organization, the church should have guidelines um you know i i don't you know the abuse that my husband committed i i believe maybe naively that it was just 20 years ago and it wasn't anything since then i could be totally wrong um but most cases it, it's still going on and if someone's not somebody has to be reporting it you know somebody has to say something somebody has to speak up for the people that aren't able to speak up for themselves um, and so as a policy, instead of the church saying, let's keep quiet, we don't want to disturb anyone's testimony, they should be saying, we need to protect the children, and we need to help the, the people that are affected. I just wanted, oh, RFM, you're muted. I, I just wanted to jump in and say, and, and Rebecca, you said it, but with mandatory reporting, I think that's, or, or the background checks, that's the other side of it is that mm -hmm. for background checks to work, it needs to be reported. And I think it's a terrible excuse that people will use sometimes to say, well, background checks won't help because look, he wouldn't have come up on it. But that's why it's, it's, it's not that one Thing, you know, by itself will solve all the problems. There's nothing that's going to solve all the problems, but obviously these things need to work together. So if people did report and if this had reported and the church also did background checks, then it would show up. And so I just, I, I'm glad you, you brought that up, the, the importance of the reporting. And I did just want to give um, really quick a shout out to uh, floodlit.org, which covered um, this case and many others. And we've talked about it before. There's an entire database. They've got latest news going on. Um, you can report abuse. Um, and we're always encouraging whether anytime, whether it's current or past, you know, like this case, we see a lot of times um, abuse isn't disclosed for decades sometimes. And so, um, yeah, so you can go to report abuse here. And then there are also, um, they also have resources. So I, I'll go ahead and pull that down, but I just wanted to give that shout out real quick. Thank you, Maven. Rebecca, am I understanding this correctly, that none of this would have ever come to light except for one counselor 
who fulfilled her duty as a mandatory reporter? If it hadn't yes, been for- I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that it would not have come out because the, um, yeah. Well, it's a shame really, because I think this is a, a chance once again that the church failed. It had a chance to do the right thing, to look good because it's doing the right thing. And yet it took a pass on it and somebody else had to do the right thing because the church did not. Steve, you've got some comments. Yeah, um, a few actually. So after after the news came out um, and that President Hensie was being charged with this, I think it was uh, it was after, well, the recording was made in my ward. It was me, I did it. Um, you're not supposed to say that. That was going to be the big secret we weren't going to talk about, Steve. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> spoil the uh, yeah, it was fast and testimony meeting. And the, uh, the second counselor in the stake was the first one that got up. And he made that announcement. And the reaction after he got up and made the announcement was people getting up and bearing their testimony. And it, it disturbed me how they instantly went to this is an attack on the church this is satan's uh, satan trying to stop the work because <clears throat> because the harrisburg temple is being built i, I want to emphasize that at least on my part none of this is about the church or its teachings it is about how it has handled incidents of abuse like this and in regardless of regardless of my feelings about the church's teachings this is the important thing is is how they have handled this abuse. Um, let's see. Oh, and my, my other thought: um, <clears throat> the church is is focusing on the legal aspect of this with regard to how they're saying that President Hensey followed the law. And and based on what RFM did, RFM's analysis a, a couple weeks back, maybe that's true. Maybe he is within within the law in Pennsylvania but the church is supposed to be about doing the right thing, making the morally correct choice. And it doesn't matter what the law is. Right is right. And he didn't do the right thing. That's my opinion. Well, if I'm the church and if I'm the president, by the way, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. If I'm the church and I'm the president, I'd much rather be sued for reporting child abuse than be sued for not reporting child abuse. Yeah, I agree. They got the money to defend against anything, but one of them looks good and one of them doesn't look good. I could live with myself if I did the right thing and, and reported child abuse. Yes. Well, everybody, I don't know if you've watched the show uh, before, but typically at this point, we have a call in line. We've got a great audience. We usually have about three callers that we, we allow to ask questions. We've never had anybody really bad. Um, okay. Thoughts are crossing my mind. I'm not going to talk about that. But there have been some incidents. Police were called. But usually oh. never towards guests. <laughs> usually towards you and me. Yeah. yeah. You know who I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But we don't have to go there. So um, are you all three okay if people call and maybe ask a question? You're under no obligation to answer it. If you don't want to answer, just say, yeah, I don't want to answer that question. And that's perfectly okay. Yeah. But I also think there's a lot of people who want to call and yeah. probably want to talk to you and just tell you what they think of you in a really good way. That's my guess. Sounds good. Okay. okay. Hearing I no will... objection. No objection. Yeah. Okay. All right. Here, let's put the first one through. This is actually, I believe Kobe Reddish. Kobe. Kobe, are you there? Oh, give me a second. Let me see if I can switch you over here. Let's try that. Are you there? Bill, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I, we can all hear you. Okay, great. I just want to call in and thank your guests for their bravery in speaking out about this. Um, thanks, Steve, for the shout out. I think his emails were incredible. And I, I thank him for holding his fake presence, you know, holding him accountable for what he said. And especially uh, Rebecca and Matthew for their experiences. Um, I think one of the things we've learned as these cases happen over and over and over again is that the secrecy is the huge problem and that it, it, it's 
something that needs to change in the church desperately. And I just wanted to say that. Thank you for having this on Mormonism Live, and thanks for all you do. Thank you. Colby, before you go, I want to ask you a question. Sure. Are you still there? Yeah? How does it feel to I be mean, an inspiration? I, You know, Steve is Steve. I really thank for the shout out, but he had that bravery without any help from me. And that shows in reading his email. Um, so thanks for the shout out, Steve, but I, you did this all on your own and kudos to you for doing it. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Colby Reddish, humble to a fault. Thank you. I do. Colby. Yeah. I have to jump in here. Um, and you know, Steve, if you, whether or not Colby had anything to do with it, the fact that to do something like this is really unusual for Mormon membership to to push back against anything for the leadership. And as you were saying, Steve, that the typical response was to bear testimony and talk about this is, you know, Satan trying to pull us down. So to do that, I'm just reminded of um, uh, the, the video of this guy just dancing crazy in the field. I think it was like at a, a film festival or a music festival or something. And um, he was by himself for a long while until the second person came up and started dancing. And then it was just the two of them for a little bit, but then a third person. And then immediately it just, people started running in. It just became this massive dance thing. So to, to be, it's really lonely to be the first person to be out there on your own. Um, but once that second person comes and then the third and on and on, it, it really has this ability to become an avalanche effect. And I think I think the church is seeing that in some ways already in the decline in membership and problems with the youth programs and keeping youth. But I'm hoping that also in this regard with child abuse cover ups, that maybe we can be approaching that. And I think you're part of that, Steve, and also Colby to to do what you did and then also do it publicly so that more people can see it just gives more people the courage to do the same thing in their own words. So I appreciate, I appreciate that, that Colby's humble and, and Steve also that you're really downplaying what you're doing, but I, I just really want to put out there how important it is and how it's, it's this kind of stuff that actually makes a difference in the lives of members today. And, you know, a, a future members, children that are in the church um, who will either be more protected or maybe may leave uh, for safer areas. It's just, it's really, really important. And I would love to see the members of the church get to this tipping point where more are like you, Steve, and more are like Colby, who will push back and not, you know, give heartfelt testimonies about, um, you know, Satan stopping the work when someone gets arrested for something they probably should be arrested for. So I just want to say thank you guys. Thank you, Maven. Steve, Maven reminds me that there's one thing we want to mention too, is that as fate would have it last Sunday, this past Sunday was state conference. Yeah. And typically in state conference, the state <clears throat> leadership, including the state president and a lot of other people are asked to be sustained by the stake membership. Yeah. What happened there? as far as you're concerned well as far as i'm concerned i i did not attend state conference but i uh, i had a heartfelt conversation with my wife the night before because i felt strongly that i needed to stand and vote opposed i had kind of a dramatic vision in my head of what it was going to look like me standing up there alone but um yeah so she's she's an active member my wife and my kids go to church and it's, it's their community so we we agreed that it would be kind of embarrassing for her, for her, for me to do that. So uh, the compromise was that I would uh, email our bishop and convey my opposing vote to him. So I did, and he responded to me and said, "Hey, can we talk?" And so we had a conversation uh, this last Sunday. He's a nice guy. I mean, he I, I really believe that he's sincere uh, in his beliefs, but he came down supporting President Hensi. Um, and, you know, since everything is, is so hidden and in, in, in the shadows, he doesn't know everything and I don't either, but that was his conclusion is, you know, just trust the leaders. Do you, do you know more tonight about the situation after this show than you did before, Steve? Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, some, and, and none of it has improved my, uh, improved my opinion of what was done. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, do we have another caller, Bill? We're up to yes. number two now. Yep. So this, I believe, is uh, Matt. Matt, are you there? Yes. Hello. Hi there, Bill hey. and RSM. Go ahead, my friend. Um, I just wanted, I wanted to thank also Rebecca, Matthew, and Steve for, you know, sharing their their sides of the story and adding adding to to this story. Um, I had a few questions. I was just curious, um, what is the likelihood of President Hinty flipping in this situation? I think mean, it's it's uh, and this is for everyone. Um, love your opinion on this too, RFM. Uh, but like, what's his what's the op, uh, the chances of of President Hinty like feeling the pressure and flipping? Um, and to go along with that, like, has he retained his own counsel? Does anyone know if he's got his own? No, I think the church is paying for his attorney. I think the church is paying for his attorney. And Matt, when you say flipping, President Hinty flipping. Against whom? Yeah, so flip like just flipping uh, and feeling the pressure from the church and saying, "Hey, the ch starting to say the church, the church is making me do this." Like I just feel like he's just going to be a fall guy for the church in this situation. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I think so, and I think the church is taking steps to make sure that they have provided his attorney so that they can be involved in his defense and what his defense attorney does. It was quite shocking to me when the announcement was made that President Haney had been talking with all the lawyers involved. Now, I don't know that that means all the lawyers involved, but that's what was said, and that's pretty concerning. It sounds like the church has got its finger in every pie. So they're pulling the strings, it sounds like. And I'm sure that, and I talked about the potential for a conflict of interest that the church or its attorneys might have, which is, are they going to be representing President Hensey or are they going to be trying to protect the church from any potential legal liability? If indeed it is found by the judge that President Hensey was required to report this. Because if the church gave him that legal advice to not, which the church did via the hotline and Curtin McConkie, as we all know, then the church could be in some sense liable. So that's the whole issue there. And if you're asking if President Hensey might flip against the church, of course he's not going to do that. Any more than Steve's bishop is going to come down on Steve's side and not on his state president's side, because we all remember in the church which way we face. Thank you, Matt. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And y'all have a great night. You too. Thanks, Matt. And then our last caller here, I believe, is going to be by the name of Cheryl. Cheryl, are you there? Yes. You're can you hear me? You can. You're on Mormonism Live. Great. Um, I kind of came in late at the podcast. Um, I joined, I don't know, maybe halfway through. So obviously, I was a little confused. I missed the first part. Um, so uh, it was Rebecca's husband who was charged with the charges. Was he, I just had a question, was he like in a position of authority at that time of the abuse of the boys? Was he a bishop or a state president or, or of a high position? I'll let Rebecca answer that. My understanding is no, because he was in his early 20s. But go ahead, Rebecca. Did you hear the question? And you're unmuted too. Yeah, I did. So I don't, I mean, I don't think so. I don't, it was 20 years ago. I don't know what calling he had. Um, he was called into the bishopric in 2005. Um, so I, I don't so think. So five years later. Yeah, I don't think he was anything at the time. Yeah, and that's something that Bill had okay. asked me earlier today. And it's, there are these permutations. So it's a great question. I'm glad you asked it, Cheryl. No, at the time of the abuse. Um, Sean Gooden was not a bishop. He didn't have a leadership role. But when he confessed it to the state president, Hinsey, in October of 2020, he was a bishop and had been for four years. And served in a state presidency before that. Right. So on multiple occasions, 
people prayed about his name, felt the Holy Ghost tell them that he was the right person for the calling, sent the recommendation up to Salt Lake, and at least in the instance of Bishop, got the approval of the first presidency to issue that call when the abuse had taken place years earlier. Right. And Cheryl, if you go back and listen to the show, you'll find out that he was also a young men's president during that time period. And also he had a position involved with the uh, the Boy Scouts as well in the ward or stake. Yeah. And I, I ended that call already, but I'm sure. She okay. Thanks for calling, Cheryl. Yeah. Okay. I think we're, we're wrapping it up here. Once again, Matthew, Rebecca, Steve, thanks so much for coming on the show. We're going to bid you a fond farewell. And once again, our our thanks, our respect, our gratitude for coming on the show and sharing your story. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Good night. And now, Mr. Real, I got a question for you. Yes. What is going on, my friend? You seemed unusually emotional tonight. Is that something you can share with us? Uh, when Rebecca Biblioteca put uh, her comments there, talking about how when we have this... Uh, systemic policy of silence that there could be numerous other victims and nobody ever gets the opportunity to put two and two together to figure it out. And it just strikes me that here's what my thought was. The church has a risk management playbook because it works. In other words, when you, when you say, here's what we're going to do, everybody do not talk to the victims. Do not say a word to them. Contrary to the church's website about how it handles abuse of victims. It says, we're not going to say anything to the membership. We're going to keep this a secret. We're not going to talk about it. It seems as though the church has gotten the feedback over whatever, 40 years, 50 years, that doing things that way, most people will remain silent. Most people will not speak up. Most people will go on their merry way and will not uh, do anything to make the church look bad or to or to put the, the case out into... Uh, public spaces. So the church does this thing where it says one thing on its website about how it handles abuse and it does something completely different. And it, and I just noted that this isn't the only case. It's, there are far more cases exponentially that we never have heard about because the risk management playbook works than the ones that we have. The church has mitigated so much of this without having to be accountable or pay the price of, of its own involvement in all of these issues. So, so that was what it was. It was as Rebecca Biblioteca said that I just connected the dots and went, not only in this case, is there the potential for five, 10, 25 more victims that no parent even knows that they should go talk to their 25 year old kid to see if they were affected as well. Right. But now you, you start going, how many cases are out there that never, ever make the news because the church's playbook works. Okay. So there's that concept. And then the other thing that, as I was getting through this interview, going on the church's website, I mean, LDS church, you're lying. You're claiming that you are the gold standard, that you do everything in the world to protect victims, that you do everything you can to reduce abuse. But then your playbook encourages, imposes that you operate in the shadows in silence. And hence, you're actually doing the very opposite of what you claim you do. And that to me is unforgivable. Okay. Thanks for explaining that to me. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. I could tell you were affected by it. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for watching the show tonight. Please share it with family. Please share it with friends. Hit the like button. Please subscribe. Leave a comment below. And thank you very much. And we'll see you next week at 6.20 p.m. here on Mormonism Live. Thanks for watching.